everyone. This is Manisha from Teach Your Kids. And I am here today with one of my favorite people in the world, Noah Apple Mayers, who is the founder of Brooklyn Apple Academy, one of the oldest and most iconic homeschool co-ops in New York, New York, located in the wonderful neighborhood of Park Slope. And Noah and I have been friends for a really long time now. You've, you've changed from a new friend to an old friend. And it's been really incredible watching this micro-schooling movement grow over the last seven, eight years um, when we met Book and Apple Academy, I think, was still in the basement of a synagogue. And now you have your own space. And it's really amazing. So I will let you talk more about Brooklyn Apple Academy. But I'm just so happy to have you here with me today. Thanks for thanks for having us. Thanks us. <laughs> thanks for having <laughs> yeah, us. Yeah, it was you, the group. You're you're representing. I guess homeschooling is pretty much year round, and in that spirit, you have been offering all kinds of cool camps this summer. But um, we are, you know, you do also follow an enrollment cycle that's similar to the school year. So, um, can you tell us a little bit about? Um, What's in store for students this year? What is Brooklyn Apple Academy and um, what people should know if they're interested in joining? We're offering seven days of programming this year for the first time. So we have things going on on the weekends now. Um, we've got a, a teen takeover that's really popular on Sundays and a big group of teens come and cook and play board games and get really silly. And on Saturdays, we have a destination photography class. The kids are going to be traveling around the city and learning about photography and, um, and shooting interesting destinations. Through the week, we have a bunch of new programs this year. Uh, we're working with a couple new partners, we're working with uh, Coco NYC, which is a, a group that does really cool, has a really cool outdoor uh, construction spot a couple blocks away from us in Park Slope. And they every year they do a soapbox soap box racing camp and they finish the summer with a big soapbox race down the slope here. So uh, we're going to be in their building lot um, every Monday in the mornings. And then um, also working with Playground NYC, uh, they have a big adventure playground on Governor's Island and uh, are really involved in uh, self-directed play and kids being kids. Um, so we're going to be using their space every Wednesday until it gets cold. Um, so we're, we're uh, reaching out to some new partners and some new organizations that do similar stuff to us. Oh, and I'm, I'm teaching a really fun class this year that I'm really excited about. I'm teaching a class for my first class for teens, which is an infrastructure study class. So we're going to be studying three different kinds of New York City infrastructure and meeting with elected officials and city planners and uh, like learning about the city, but then also learning that we can impact, uh, how, what the future is and like, and how it grows. How amazing. So a lot of people, when they think about homeschooling, they probably still imagine a parent teaching their child at home, which is very different than homeschooling looks like in reality for a lot of people. And I think, you know, before the pandemic, people had really never heard of a homeschool co-op or a learning pod. And now more people are familiar with the concept. But if, if a parent, can you tell us a little bit more about the structure. Um, I remember when we were working together, parents could choose from one, two, three, or four days a week. They show up at kind of similar to school hours. How, how does it work if you to attend Brooklyn Apple? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, parents can come one, two, or three days a week, occasionally four. Uh, my own kid would come obviously quite often. Most of our school days are 9 to 2.45 or 9 to 3. And, um, they, yeah, they choose what they, what they want, what they, uh, what they're interested in. Um, you know, homeschoolers in New York City have a lot of really cool options. Um, it's, uh, there's a lot going on here. Um, so we're just one of like one of the many great options that homeschoolers have. And then beyond that, we're also having community events all the time. We have, uh, leading up to the school year, we have four days of not back to school activities a picnic, a beach day, a board game meetup. We're going to go to the New York Liberty, um, a WNBA basketball game. So we're just really bringing community together um, because uh, it's really dismal <laughs> not having community. I think, the, I think the pandemic taught us that uh, community is, is, is really important for our health. Uh, it's like a, it's an organ of the body. Um, so when we're missing it, we're really, uh, we're not at, I, I'm not at full health when I'm not 
like a part of a community. Um, so that's one thing that we're offering. And for a lot of homeschoolers, it takes them a while to find community and to find their people. Um, I've met homeschoolers who were homeschooling for a couple of years before they found out about Broken Apple or the New York Homeschoolers uh, Associations and stuff like that. So uh, it can take people. It can take people a while to find each other, uh, especially within the, the secular homeschool community, because people kind of drift in and out of homeschooling, and and that's fine. I think people use homeschooling or unschooling uh, when they need it, um, and when you know, like especially at like certain inflection points in a childhood or in a life, um, you might just need some time off or need some more unstructured time, or just need to run around more. Um, and, you know, for those years, whether they be one or two or 10, um, you know, uh, we're here for you. Wonderful. And Brooklyn Apple Academy is such a focal point for the homeschooling community in Brooklyn. And I would say even people who aren't necessarily homeschooling, who have just decided that having that this kind of community that Brooklyn Apple Academy offers and the types of eclectic activities are just really important to them and especially to their children. Um, you know, some families would say, you know, well, we can never leave Brooklyn Apple Academy because my child has to be around Noah, you know, and I think that you are really, um, you know, it's such a privilege to be able to choose your child's teacher. And I know children feel so wonderful and have so much fun and feel so safe and loved around you. So you as a teacher has been, I think, a really important part of shaping that community. You mentioned some of the different kinds of people in your community, um, unschoolers and, you know, people who are looking to run around. And, you know, could you give me a sense of the flavor of the different, I don't want to say like archetypes or kinds of people who choose to enroll at Brooklyn Apple Academy and what um, needs they're looking to fulfill by being part of this community? Yeah, I mean, connection. Is the is, is a is a big is a big thing, uh, you know. Just having I think parents want to make sure that their kids have a choice of of friends to hang out to hang out with and and, and a place to make friends. Um, you know, Brooklyn Apple is also a place to make messes and to use tools and uh, cook in, in in ways that you that are difficult to do in a small New York City apartment. Um, we have a big food <laughs> shop, we have a big kitchen, um, and I'm. Yeah, and we're just expect messes to happen. Like when kids are cooking here, like I am complete, one hundred percent ready for an egg to fall on the floor, and for my reaction or whatever, whoever staff member's reaction to, to the when that happens, it's like okay, like, <laughs> that happens. <laughs> where as a parent, where I'm cooking at home, like I'm really a pain in the butt. I'm really uptight. I'm kind of <laughs> done. Oh my gosh, picking up messes. Like I have like, and so if an egg falls on the floor at home, I'm like oh. Yeah, I'm just like, uh, or flour lands outside the bowl. But like, Brooklyn Apple is a place like we we make messes. We we make potion. Like we'll have a kid like uh, cooking a potion, which is the south. Like, like they found this uh, the south. One kid found uh, the South Beach Diet, which is a book, um, and found a paperback copy and brought it back to Apple. Was like, oh, this is for potions, and he put it in a pot with some water and some spices. And maybe some onions <laughs> and, and cooked it up. It's like, I, like, I don't know if I have patience to do that at home, but I broke it up. It's like the infrastructure is there to just get weird and explore and, you know, have, uh, have fun with that. And, um, I have to go back one second to what you said. Uh, you said some kind words about me, but everyone else that works at Broken Apple is 10 times more patient and more wonderful and a better teacher than me. So no, I'm, no, I'm no. <laughs> I, I don't believe it, but you're, you're humble. <laughs> they are wonderful. You have so many wonderful teachers and you've grown so much since it was Noah and six children and occasionally a parent helper or an intern or something of that nature. Yeah. It's, it's really amazing to see the, the very different types of teachers that you've attracted and, and going back to what you were talking about, you know, dropping an egg on the floor. I think one thing that's always struck me uh, you know, whenever I wanted to have someone collaborate with me, I asked them to come and walk into Brooklyn Apple Academy. And I feel like this kind of seals the deal. <laughs> it's my closer. You know, you've been so nice about, you know, letting me 
bring various technical co-founders into the space. And, you know, they just go to Brooklyn Apple Academy and say, okay, now I understand the future of education. This is so cool. And, um, and sometimes you just kind of have to see it and to live it to understand. And, and for me, you know, I remember the first time that I visited Brooklyn Apple Academy, you invited me to come on a field trip to the Brooklyn Museum or no, actually, I think, well, it was the Brooklyn Museum and the Brooklyn Library. And I remember I, you know, I was very unfamiliar with this idea of self-directed learning and, um, you know, kind of children's rights, whatnot. And I, and I, and I go and I show up and I see six children like swinging around this like stairs to go up to the Brooklyn library, like, like monkeys. Like I was like six little monkeys that were just swinging around this uh, stairwell bar. And I remember this kind of feeling of like this kind of teacher response in me of like, Oh my gosh, they're going to get hurt. And you know, they weren't in any sort of danger at all. It was very low railing, but I just wasn't used to seeing that level of like unbridled, unchecked child aliveness and energy. And it's, um, you know, we have in our society, these kind of adult spaces and children's spaces, and we tend to kind of hide that wild aliveness away. And, you know, as I came to know you and kind of whew, let go and question my own conditioning, I started to just really appreciate this aspect of what you were creating. And of course, I mean, the children were amazing at the museum, like you couldn't ask for more respectful and inquisitive, interested kids. So, um, I guess, you know, where I'm going with this beyond, you know, is, is talking about this, you know, this space for aliveness where you have parents and kids and this unchecked energy. And, and you, um, if I, I believe you consider yourself a democratic school. And so can you talk a little bit about how you, how democracy operates at your school, how you give children a voice in, in what goes on and create that space for their own freedom? Two part question. Yes. Um, Two part. <laughs> like, yeah. So about the aliveness. Yes. Like, um, yes. I think we're always just like trying to go up to the edge of like, what is safe and like, and what can we do? And there's, and, and often really like sometimes negotiating uh, and renegotiating with the kids. And I guess this goes in the democracy too. But like I one to like, there's this wall that's about waist height, but the kids really like to walk on, on the edge of the park. Um, and we, we walk on that all the time and it's, it's a lot of fun. You just, it's, it's, you're using balance. There's a very small danger element. Um, it's not like it's waist height. Um, but we had, I remember having one student that was you know very confident, had to be on the wall. He was like, um, very and very sure of himself. And I made a rule one time as like, um, cause it was, it was snowy. And it was like the wall, this top of the wall is slippery. Um, like, um, I, you know, like we're, we're not walking on the wall today. And he was like, we had, a, and this, this like completely like broke his brain. He like, just like, oh, no. oh, I, need to be on, I need to be on top of the wall. Like, like, and so we had this, we had a long we had like a long talk. It was like okay, the rest of the group is going to go with um, we're, uh, is going to go with the other the other staff member because I can't have ten kids on a slippery wall, but I can have one kid who is very you know is very supervised and me next you know right next to him um, be on the slippery wall because it means so much to him and his his sense of like just like bodily autonomy at that moment. I don't know. So like we're in small enough groups that like we can kind of work with kids on, on situations that are like very important to him, but you know, stressful, stressful for a group. It's like groups. I think there's a lot of things that like groups aren't able to do, um, because of the size, like where you can, with, with smaller groups, you can kind of really just acknowledge, you know, acknowledge the truth about someone in that, in that moment. Um, so I think we're able to do that. Um, but we are constantly kind of reevaluating risk and danger, um, you know, as we go. And, and, um, and I think we do a pretty good job of it for the most part. 
I agree. I, and sometimes even in the wood shop, haven't I, I know that you at, at a certain point worked with Gebra Tully at Brightworks in San Francisco, and and you have some really interesting guidelines in terms of how children are in the wood shop. Kids use tools at Brooklyn Apple. Um, we have had a wood shop for six or seven years now, and we have not sent anyone to the emergency room or even with stitches <laughs> from the wood shop. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. More than shop at school, I'm sure, with their rigid guidelines. No, yeah. I mean, like, I, I think you know, like it's I think kids want to take risks um, and it's it's developmentally appropriate that they take risks and that they're kind of pushing, you know, pushing, you know, pushing the boundaries of, you know, of what they can do. And I think in a in the system that have a million kids and 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 can be sued for millions of dollars. Um, like you just, like you just can't, there's a lot of things you can't do. Like they've taken pools out of schools and there's like, there's no sharp edges. And, and when I see kids on field trips, um, in the park, um, they're, they have to be very, you know, very regimented, very close together. And it's like a, it's a very, it's a different experience. Um, and this is because of scale. And I think, you know, small scale, um, allows humans to be, you know, more themselves. Sure. And it allows for more democracy. It's easier to come to agreement. Yeah. So as far as, as far as we're look differently than other democratic schools, we don't have a lot of long, we don't have a lot, we don't have a lot of meetings. Um, and <laughs> a lot of uh, votes, <laughs> a lot of votes. Uh, what we do do is that in the, in the morning kids come in and they talk about what kind of projects they want to work on. We we'll go around the room. It's a kid wants to start a store selling lemonade. Then someone else might come in and like, Oh, can I join your store? I want to sell brownies. And, and I can be like, Oh, sure. You can join my store. Or they might say, No, I want to do no. store. I love it. <laughs> uh, and then in that case, we're like, Okay, well, uh, maybe we'll set up two different tables or maybe we'll have two different time slots. Uh, kids learn very early on that if they have too many collaborators, and their store, then they have to split the money like five ways. And the math on that gets, uh, you know, gets, can get sad for a kid that wants to make a lot of money. Sure. Like, I, for don't, sure. I don't want to split $20 five ways. I want $20. Uh, yeah. So there's a ton of lessons we learned from like, from these micro capitalist uh, projects that the kids do. I think the, uh, I think that that is one of the popular projects around here is starting a store. Uh, Cause we're on a, um, a busy commercial Avenue or in fifth Avenue in Brooklyn. And, and there's a lot of foot traffic, a lot of like incredible friendly neighbors. Um, and so we, they, that is a, that is a big project. And I think the, there's so many lessons that are learned in, uh, within that project. Um, my favorite one being this kind of rejection therapy that happens where kids are, they might be selling, you know, if they're selling about their popcorn or whatever, and 20 people will go by and say, no, you know, no thanks. Or they'll say the, the meanest lie that the grown up says, I'll be back. <laughs> oh no. I feel well, like I'm that person. <laughs> so bad. Don't say no. Don't say, don't say I'll be back. <laughs> No, it's fine. Kids can hear it. Everyone can, people can hear it. No, rather. Anyway, so our I'll be back or, um, the good, anyway, so they hear this rejection 20 times. And then the 21st person that comes by says, Oh, sure. I love a bag of popcorn. And then here's, and then here's, and then here's $5. Here's $5. Keep the change. You know, like they, so they get to have that feeling of like, Oh, mm, oh like those 20 rejections and then like that one like success. And, uh, I feel that's good just for just like, I don't know, building up um, some kind of inner strength. A hundred percent. And I was thinking also about what you were saying, just you phrased it so beautifully about how you were giving children the space to go as far as they could towards their limit um, without getting hurt. And I I'm wondering, I mean, now, wow, like you were working with five-year-olds and some of the children from the original Brooklyn Apple are teens, maybe even college now. I'm curious if you've observed some of the, I don't want to use the word results, but how this has impacted it, who they've become as adults today, this, this kind of education that, um, that you're offering them. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I don't have scientific data. 
your like, experience and all, observations would be they're all they're plenty. Also awesome, would be and they're plenty. Also confident and they yeah. just doing really cool things. I have one student that's uh, I, wait, I don't know if you ever met Blake, but he's going to be he's he's on a PhD path already, and he's eighteen or nineteen. Um, he went to study college at sixteen. Anyway, so I can't take credit for all that. Um, but uh, but for homeschoolers and unschoolers, uh, I think it. And I homeschooled one year. I, I think it really helps to understand that whatever you're going to do going forward or learn, um, that you're self empowered to 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 go in those directions, to get those resources, to learn what you need to learn. Um, you don't. You, you you don't need to rely on um, on school administrators or a school system to make that happen. You 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 um, I don't know. We should all be autodidacts, really. Um, people that uh, enjoy learning, and if you enjoy learning, you're just going to keep learning, and it's going to take you into cool paths. For sure, and I I think some of these students, you know, character traits I think of. Our resilience, um, a willingness to try new things. I see a lot of openness towards adults and different people in their lives. Uh, so some of those qualities are ones that I, I have remarked on your students as they've grown. Yeah, I, I think homeschoolers are less afraid of grownups and older kids, especially there's a lot of uh, age mixing um, or like like uh, that goes on at Brooklyn Apple. So there's kids... Uh, you know, four and a half up to 11 at Brooklyn Apple on a lot of days. And then the teens are sometimes popping in. So, uh, where uh, as I growing up, I was always with mostly with kids my own age and any, anyone a year older was a demigod. Um, and, uh, I was kind of, in, uh, you know, a little afraid of them. Um, but I think kids here, like, can see like, oh, these, these seven year olds, it's your five, you know, these seven year olds, they're cool or whatever, but like, you know, <laughs> I don't know if they're demigods. Often, you know, when I go to Brooklyn Apple Academy, first of all, there's very huge variety of the number of kids on any given day. One day there might be two, one day there might be 20. Often you'll see parents in the classroom and it's it's much different than walking into a school classroom where it's just one adult and a bunch of kids. It's all different ages. And it's real. a lot of the parents come in and volunteer, work in the shop. Um, and sometimes they'll bring a toddler with them. It's It's pretty great. In, in that regard. And perhaps um, you mentioned that part of what you do in your democratic system is that at the beginning of the day, students meant students get to select a project they might want to work on for that day. Could you talk us through what a typical day looks like? Maybe we'll, we'll save field trip day for, for after, but what, what might a day at Brooklyn Apple look like for a student? How is it structured? Yeah. So uh, they come in in the morning, kind of get settled. Maybe start playing a little bit, hang out with their friends. And around 930, when everyone has finally drifted in, homeschoolers uh, on the whole are not uh, as time um, uh, rigid with time as uh, as others. And, like, and also our space is not like I would prefer the kids coming in, like uh, not stressed out. But, you know, the, the parents not to be stressed out and the kids not to be stressed out about arriving right at a rigid time because that's really a uh, cruddy way to start a day, just like being really stressed out about time. Uh, but it's like, it's like very common uh, way to start your day. So anyway, so we, we're not like very rigid about time. They, they all filter in and by 9.30, uh, 9.45, uh, we'll have a meeting um, about what kind of projects we want to work on for the day. So we'll go around in a circle and um, yeah, and the kids will say, I want to go to the park. I want to bake bread. I want to work on my movie. I want to make a comic book. I want to play Dungeons and Dragons. And every, and then uh, if other kids want to collaborate, they'll raise their hands and then, um, we'll have a, a list of all the activities that could happen in that day. And, uh, and then staff will make sure that they have whatever one on one help they need, uh, whatever ingredients if they're cooking or whatever supplies they, they need if they're making a project. If for some reason we don't have that supply, there's a dollar store across the street or a hardware store one block away. So that handles a lot of it. Um, but if they want to make something really extreme that we don't have, you know, like, or it's hard to source, then sometimes order that and make sure that they have it next week. Uh, so yeah, so we're really you know facilitating their creative dreams, and um, I'm sometimes extremely jealous of this kind of uh, life that they have. Because um, if I had a place where I would just like 
thumb de dum de dum let's wake up and like I'll go to this place and uh and then it was like so what do you want to do today how can i make that happen uh <laughs> that sounds fun uh yeah so anyway i'm jealous i think i think they have it pretty good they have it pretty good I mean, but what you do is very different than coddling them. I mean, you allow children to experience natural consequences of their actions. You don't just give them whatever you want. Can you kind of help us understand how you navigate? Um, and I don't want to say like behavioral challenges or challenges that might arise or, you know, really, you know, give children that sense that they are responsible rather than just, you know. I think there is... There is some of that <laughs> happening within that, within that structure of like, as I just mentioned, they show up and like, there's like this really yeah, good opportunity. Okay. Um, so that's, that's pretty wonderful. Um, we are this small society. We're all this small group. I think people in general want to make things work and they, they want to go through their days without too much conflict and tension. Um, so I think there is just a natural desire for people to want to work things out and want to work out conflicts um, in positive ways so that they can just have days that are not um, where the tone is, 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 is not a stressful one and where they just feel at ease. Um, so, you know, for the most part, I think we're able to just guide people towards that place um, because that's where people want to go. Um, not that we haven't had students that love drama. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's getting like, um, and get something from that, like, uh, some kind of like, uh, there's like a, there's actually kind of a nice feeling you can get from like a charge through the body of like, of excitement. Um, so for those students, then we'll have to be like, okay, but I realize that you love drama and conflict, but <laughs> here at Birth on Apple, we can't, we can't do all that here. Uh, and you know, sometimes these things take time and these are relationships that we build over the course of the year and years. Um, and for the most part, we're able to work all these things out with kids that so we have, you know, occasionally, um, Brooklyn Apple is not the best fit for kids. We have some kids that come here and really the best fit for them because of what, whatever they're going on, whatever they're going through in their life usually is like structure. Like, Oh, your life is, um, really kind of falling apart right now you could use, really use a place where everything's the same every day and, or you know similar every day and you have a very you know a, a, a clear set of of you know a clear set of very um minute boundaries and rules and for some kids that that, that is actually what they need um and it's taken us a while to kind of like recognize that okay maybe brooklyn apple while brooklyn apple is super fun and stimulating uh, for a lot of kids, and that's what they need um, for other kids, like that might not actually be the best match. Yes. And what I've observed is that typically those children tend to be a little bit older and they're used to the more strict rules of school and that kind of freedom that they experience at Brooklyn Apple might just feel totally overwhelming and they don't know where to find themselves in that space. It can be also true, in, you know, with younger kids who just need things to be very well organized. But I think that it, it is very hard when you have been, I will say, oppressed, because I think that a lot of schools are oppressive environment to suddenly be able to do whatever you want. That can be a bit shocking. Yeah, and there's a yeah, there's the de-schooling term and uh, idea that people go through. Uh, I know it was a shock to me when I first I, I uh, interned at Brooklyn Free School and I came in from the school system. That, um, that was all, I, you know, that all I knew besides my one year of homeschooling. And yeah, that was, that was, that was, it, it's a big, it's a big culture shock. It's, it's much different, um, to have a place where kids are empowered and it's all about their, um, their interests. And it's really, it's not, uh, for a, a staff member, you know, uh, such as myself, like sometimes I have my, myself or other staff members will have really great ideas of things that we want, uh, you know, that, that, that we think the kids will love. And, but it's not, you know, it's not, it's not where they're at and not what they want to do. And, um, and it can be sad and disappointing. You're like, no, don't you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, I've heard several people refer to you as the most emotionally intelligent person that they know. And <laughs> where I, I'm just so in awe of how you're able to step back and allow children to have their freedom. I mean, in me, it's something I really needed to work on is that impulse to control and manage behavior is so strong. Um, and 
perhaps from my teacher training or upbringing, but you just seem to be able to let go in such a natural, organic way. Is that ever hard? I mean, how do you think you became like this guru of children? It's been time and, and good teachers. Um, um, I unfortunately tend to learn, like I need, I can't just accept um, like uh, established knowledge sometimes. I'm just like, okay, like you say we have to do this, but like, why can we do, <laughs> can we do it this other way? And like, and that's, that's how I learn. Um, fortunately and unfortunately. Um, but as far as emotional intelligence, I, I can, uh, uh, I, uh, you know, I picked up definitely some skills from, uh, non, uh, NBC or non violent communication, um, a few years ago. And before that, I would definitely not say that I was the most emotional intelligent person. Uh, but that definitely like helped give me a roadmap for like understanding feelings and, and needs and stuff like that. They do. They do teach you a lot. I, I have often heard this phrase, uh, the red thread of desire. So, Yes, to desire is suffering, but if we can kind of follow our desire to and that suffering to all the way, that's where the insight emerges. And it seems like you do really allow the children to experience that suffering and let them teach it what it may. <laughs> Buddha Noah. Um, so I, you know, when we the way we met, I didn't even say the way we met, but my first company was called Cottage Class and it was a marketplace for micro schools. So the idea was that a teacher could list their micro school on our site. We would do payments and marketing for them and potentially help with other things like space. I ended up, you know, trying out a lot of stuff. And Noah was really the first person who partnered with us. And we had so many learnings along the way. And um, it was really fun getting the word out for this wonderful community that so many people needed but didn't necessarily know about. During the pandemic, there's this phrase learning pod that arose and tons of people started building micro schools with like one teacher, a group of kids, and there are more and more of them. And I think it's a kind of a really amazing place to experiment, et cetera. But one thing that I really dislike about this is that I feel like these people are basically recreating school. Like this environment is five days a week nine to three, very little parent involvement set on like learning certain academic skills and, you know, maybe learning it in more innovative ways, doing project-based learning, outdoor learning, using cooler curriculum. But the same way, they're still learning all the skills in the same place at the same time in the same way, which I feel is a little bit antithetical to the spirit of homeschooling, which is every child learning in a unique way for themselves. And what I really love about Brooklyn Apple Academy is that you're not trying to be a school. And when we think about modular learning, I've been using this term a lot to describe this certain type of homeschooling where parents are really trying to curate the ideal education for their unique child. There are these different modules. So you might learn math one-on-one -on -one with a parent or with a tutor or in independent study. You might learn drama by going to a drama club. You might learn science by going on a school bus that has a science lab. Or you might learn music by hosting a class in your house. And you will often join a homeschool co-op like Brooklyn Apple Academy where children will learn different kinds of skills like how to get along in a group, how to be you know, civic action, how to start their own business, you know, and uh, these, you know, and learning from role models such as you and the other teachers. And I just, I just really feel like, I guess this isn't really a question, <laughs> it's more of a statement, but I just feel like it's a really big mistake for these micro schools to try to recreate school or for a parent to send their child to a micro school and say, okay, now it's done. I'm outsourcing my child's education to this place. And uh, so what do you think are the skills that children are developing at Brooklyn Apple Academy that I think are vital to their education? What would you, what are they, what are they getting out of it, Noah? <laughs> I, I am not the most ideological person in this movement or that you'll ever meet. And I'm fine with incremental change. Uh, when it comes to education. Um, so if, if you're in a micro school and it looks a little, and it looks kind of like school, 
I'm sure they're going to be able to kind of honor the individual more than in a larger school. And like the kids are probably going to have fun. They're probably going to have fun, Manisha. It's probably going to be. They're going to have a ton of fun. I mean, these schools are wonderful. They're like one of my best friends. And, and, uh, and, uh, (laughs) and then also like one thing I have, uh, strove not to do is to ever question decisions that other parents make, uh, especially in my life. Um, (laughs) <laughs> um, uh, because like, it's also individual, like, and, um, yes. Um, the, the, and funny enough, the homeschooling I did, um, actually, you know, because it was in 19, uh, uh, 93 or 94, um, did actually, they were, um, the, the unschooling, I don't think was something that my parents knew about or. So it did look a lot like school for the first half of the day. We had like, we sat down in, 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 uh, in a desk across from, um, my, my parents. And then I homeschooled with my best friend and his, his parents. And so for the first half of the day, it looked very much like school. Uh, but then the second half of the day was self-directed and we chose what we wanted to do. And a lot of the it was room within those projects to decide some of our subjects. So like, you know, I don't know, schoolishness, um, if you know if you can cut down on some of that in, in, in a micro school, and that's great. I'm I'm, I'm okay with in, incremental change, um, and what other people you know decide. Um, what we do at Brooklyn Apple is um, you know it's it's, it's obviously um, it's what I've decided to do. Um, and what we do, what we learn here, uh, we learn how to work in groups. Uh, we learn how to collaborate. Uh, I think these are things that um we need to learn as human beings uh if we're gonna like move forward uh and it's something that i think we're uh, often Ill- I, or i feel ill-equipped to do or i feel like our society is not as ill-equipped um i think sometimes when i'm in groups it's very hard for for people to think about uh to kind of balance individual out individuality with with groups and um we're a very kind of hyper capitalist, hyper individualist society, um, and you know, I guess Brooklyn Apple is, is is somewhat a product of that. Um, uh, but you know, I think we need to learn how to work together and how to do that uh, without the hierarchy of, of grown ups kind of direct, you know, pulling the strings um, and making things happen for kids to be able to kind of make, you know, make, you know make their own movies to make their own projects. And we're here as an advisory role, but not, we're not the captain. Um, so I think that's useful. And then like, you know, just be given space, you know, given space. Uh, there's often sometimes we're in the park or on a field trip where a kid will go off by themselves and read a book under a tree or just sit under a tree for a little bit and have um, solitude. And I, when I first saw that, I was like, Oh wow. I, with it, that, that kid there, they have, three brothers and sisters in a, in a small apartment, like where in their life do they ever get a moment of solitude? Um, and for myself, I grew up in a rural area. It was, I had, I had the access to that and it was something that I really enjoyed. Um, so I'm, I'm sometimes we are able to give that or give the gift of solitude. <laughs> um, other skills, um, uh, we do a lot of cooking. I feel like everybody should learn how to cook. Um, I think it's, uh, or I don't know. That's where I'm ideological. I think everyone should know how to cook. Life skills. <laughs> yep. There we go. Life cooking skills. movement. Yeah. Uh, people should know how to cook and, and, you know, kids handle money at a very early age, age here at Brooklyn Apple and starting stores. And they should know how, you know, I think those are good. Those are good skills. Um, uh, they, I don't know. We, you know, we're, we're, Learning how to be like human, you know, human beings that are interested in stuff and move through the world. I love so much of what you said. I mean, having that space for solitude and we all have different levels of need for solitude. And um, also just thank you for the reminder, you know, parents ultimately, I think, for the most part, really do know what's best for their child. And some of the, these micro schools are just incredible places. And I think I I was reacting more, I think, you know, when I was more involved in helping you market the school, I think sometimes I noticed a certain fear of parents that, you know, their children wouldn't get the academics that they needed at Brooklyn Apple. And 
I really try to encourage these parents to think about not just getting all the academics in one place at the same time. I mean, it seems it can feel safest to say, like, I want this other person to make sure my child is learning academics. But even in the same amount of time that you help your child with homework, they can go so far in math and language arts. And what what one person is really good at teaching, such as collaboration or cooking or self-directed learning, another person is going to be really amazing at teaching math. And uh, even when it comes to curriculum, I often tell parents, like, get a full curriculum, but get a math supplement. And there's really a lot of really extraordinary things to be found when you start piecing, taking these different pieces and putting them together into your own mosaic, as opposed to just trying to get them all taken care of in one place at one time. And, you know, I mean, I can understand, you know, people are so busy, they're working so hard, it's so stressful. And I certainly understand the temptation to outsource. But if you're outsourcing, because you don't have confidence in yourself, I would just, you know, maybe question that. I think it takes a lot of trust, Manisha. That's all. It's a. It's a lot. It does. It does. Uh, and then does I think you know, the culture and like I, I know a lot of you have to kind of go out on a limb and trust that and and trust that uh, process. Uh, especially, you might have a lot of people in your life, uh, like grandparents or something, that are like, "What the you know? What the heck are you doing?" So it's, it's going to take you know. I think you know as 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 this movement has more of a track record and, you know, goes, you know, it becomes older and has, you know, decades of experience under the, under its spell, it's going to be easier to kind of show people like, look, this, this works. Um, but you know, there's a, there's a, there's, I, I understand why people might not want to take that risk. And I think, um, and I think, you know, the, yeah, it's it's scary. Uh, it's, a, it's it's scary to try something, you know, this different, especially if you uh, if you haven't seen, haven't met kids that have gone, you know, have have done done something different and seen how cool they are, and um, you, it just takes a lot of um, faith, <laughs> faith based education. Yeah, it, do, it does take faith, and and it, it feels like a huge risk because it's someone you care about so deeply, your child and. I mean, I think, you know, I mean, really, thank you for reminding me to be a little more compassionate. You're so good for me as a friend in that way, because I can get so judgy and I forget, you know, I have breathed in the air at Brooklyn Apple Academy and seen how joyous these children are and watch them grow up from the age of four to now, you know, do, you know, getting, doing these really cool, innovative projects and helping in their community and organizing climate action or, you know, writing a book, producing a podcast. And, you know, I just have to remember, you know, not everyone is there yet, you know, take, (laughs) let them be at the point in their journey they are today. And, you know, so, so thank you. That's a good reminder for me, but I just, I love what you're doing so much. So I promised everyone we would tell them about field trip day, which is just It's legendary. Like field trip day is the most popular day at Brooklyn Apple Academy. This is your brainchild. What is it? What happens on field trip day? It's not. It's it's, yeah. It's fairly simple. It's that we are in. You know, we're in New York City, and is there? You know, are there a lot of cool things to see and do here? Yes, there just are. There's like, so um, we make use of that. That that we're you know, and I, I think another. You know, other places that's true too. Or when I grew, uh, I think what inspired field trip day is, you know, my year of homeschooling. We went on a lot of, it was in Maine. And, uh, there are, you know, and that's a rural state. It's a lot different than New York, but there are a lot of cool field trips to do with, uh, you know, in Maine. We went to the concrete factory and they took us on a tour of their, of the, of their big limestone, you know, open pit mine and into the concrete factory with this huge furnace where they were, uh, you know, with the, with the heat of the sun melting the, you know, like slaking the lime and, you know, that was inspiring. I was like, okay, this is cool. Um, and, um, and then we went on uh rock hounding field trips. We were studying immigration, um, uh, in that year. And so we, we went on a, we went, we went to New York city and we, uh, went to the, um, the tenement museum and we were in, you know, and we were in Chinatown and my mom saw steam coming out of a, a, a ninth floor window. And she's like, Oh, I know what that is. That's a gar, you know, that's a garment 
uh, you know, they're, they're making garments up there. So she, we, we walked up the nine flights of stairs up to the, uh, up to the, up to the ninth floor and we visited, um, you know, a sweatshop. Um, it, it's not, you know, a, I mean, the steam was from, they have big garment steamers to like, you know, flatten everything. Anyway, so like, the, the, like that opened my eyes to be like, okay, it's not just in, you know, what we want to learn. It's not just in the book. It is in the world and seeing it in the world is going to, and interact, you know, seeing it, that's going to actually tell you that whatever you're learning is real and has, uh, is applicable. And, um, like, why wouldn't you want to, why, why wouldn't I, or why wouldn't you want to incorporate the lessons of the world, uh, into whatever you're learning? Um, so we're here in New York City and we visit art studios from uh, artists. We, uh, I love factory visits. Um, there's tons of really great, uh, cultural institutions and museums and we visit those. Um, yeah, we've had some really incredible field. And then, uh, this last couple of years, we've had a van field trip day. So we've been able to go out into stream beds in New Jersey and look for fossils and go on really amazing hikes and, um, just like, just be out and about in the world. Um, the world's a cool place. Um, but, uh, and being able to see as much of it, uh, as you can, especially as a, as a kid is great. Um, and the kids that go through Brooklyn Apple over the course of a year might end up going on 200, 200 field trips over four or five years. Um, so, and, and get to like kind of really see New York City, uh, in ways that, and then kind of understand the totality of it that maybe their parents don't even, uh, understand. Like they've, uh, a lot of parents don't really, it's like, Oh, I don't really understand Queens or I've never been to the Bronx or I've never been to Staten Island. Well, these, these kids have, and they can kind of, they, you know, they, they have a, a, a good understanding of this, of this space and, and place. It's such invaluable experiential learning. I mean, you can learn about social science and history, geography, natural history it's 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 really amazing and 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 the field trips are just so much fun too and i think um they're just great it's you know there's a lot of there's a there's a bank street professor i think who was talking about the importance of travel in children's learning and and i've heard kind of several famous ceos say they always look for uh, employees who are well-traveled, who have been exposed to different viewpoints. And I think what's incredible about New York is that you can get every country in the world and every viewpoint just, you know, right next to your doorstep. So I, I just think field trip day is such a wonderful experience and the kids love it. Field trips are cool. Everyone should be going on lots of field trips if they can. Noah, you know, I just love Brooklyn Apple Academy so much. It's to me, it's a home away from home. It's a, it's a safe space. It's a space that makes me optimistic and feel full. Is is there anything I've missed today that we didn't touch upon? That I don't know, Manisha. I can talk about Brooklyn Apple like for hours and hours. This has been <laughs> one hour. Uh, I can talk about it much yes. longer <laughs> at a great length. If families are, are interested and they want to check it out, what's what's the best way to get started? I mean, should they come send their kid to visit for a day? How, how are you? How are you doing this? Check out our social media. We've got uh, you know thousands of pictures and videos of what we've been up to, and then from that you can get a pretty good sense, a curated sense of like you know what we're up to. Um, there's I think a, a video pinned that's a little tour of the school that you can go on, uh, and then yeah, give me you can you can call me. Uh, I talk to parents all the time. They're always welcome to call me and talk about it. And then they're always welcome to, uh, the, yeah, uh, come, come visit, uh, when we're in session, they come in and they, uh, can spend an hour or they can spend all day if they're having fun. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, come jo join us. Join us. I, you know, I, I definitely recommend a visit. Like if you're already sold, I mean, this, for some of you, this just might be incredible. Like your mind is blown that this exists and you're going to sign up right now. And and for others, you might be kind of on the fence. I would definitely recommend sending your child for a visit because nine times out of 10, your child is going to have such a great time there. And it's going to be so obvious that this is a space where they're going to love learning and make friends and where you're going to get get to be part of a community that you love. So if that's an option, I really recommend it. 
And uh, don't forget, there's plenty of things you can try at Brooklyn Apple. You can join a club, you can join a camp, you know, there's, there's lots of options, but I definitely recommend the visit. It's truly extraordinary. And I do want to mention also that if you want, you can donate to Brooklyn Apple and help them give scholarships to students who might not be able to afford it. You guys are amazing at making it possible for anyone to come. Uh, I've been lucky to be part of that process and we always find a way for people. Um, so yeah, so it's it's the Insta Brooklyn Apple Academy. I think you can find in most places. We'll have all the information in the show notes. So, all right. So as we as we wrap it up, I want to ask you: Is there anything completely unrelated to what we've talked about today that you are learning right now that you find interesting? Right now, um, I am. I've always been really interested in New York City history and history in general. And, and I'm teaching this new class about infrastructure at Brooklyn Apple. And through that, I'm reading uh, a textbook about city planning, which I've never oh, read. A, Lord. Oh my never, gosh. So I'm putting my, so I'm going back to school <laughs> um, about wow. that. And that's been really, that's been fun. That's pretty awesome. I definitely, do not want to read that textbook, but I really want to hear from you what you learned when you are ready to share it with me. That that sounds really, really amazing. I mean, I appreciate that you are bringing that textbook information to life through your class because not everybody would want to read a textbook. So thank you for doing that work. Oh, yeah. I mean, I love <laughs> and yeah. like, I'm, you know, we're always seeing its failures and successes every day as you walk down the street. Um, I know I've been in the same city, living in the same city since 1999. And so it's for, for me, and I think a lot of people that live here, it's like it, it becomes the only city and the only place in a way. Um, and you kind of, and for me, I can kind of forget, be like, oh, look, look at this city over here. It's designed in this totally different way. Not really. Oh, that really works. <laughs> like, what can we, you know, what can we do that's different? Um, so I'd like to help bring that um, eye to this, this class as well. Well, Noah, thank you so much. I mean, people listening probably noticed this this uh, conversation a little bit of a different feel than usual. Noah and I are really good friends, and it's just you know, I, I it can be really hard working to try to change education, and it's so valuable to have a friend like you, Noah, where we can laugh about things, learn to take ourselves lightly, and also as you did in this conversation, hold each other accountable. And I just really appreciate the ways that you hold me accountable to families, to children, to myself and the values that I want to bring into the world. So um, just thank you so much for being here today. And to everyone listening, I just, I love Brooklyn Apple so much. If you're thinking about it, you know, please consider giving your child this gift because it's a truly unique and magical place. Yes. All right. Thank you, Manisha. <laughs> Thank you, Noah. And, you know, <laughs> anyone listening, if you have questions, things you're curious about, please write them in the comments. We'd love to continue the conversation after the show. And uh, thanks again, Noah. I hope you have a glorious day. Thanks, Misha. You too. <laughs>